but I'm excited about this. Not because, oh gosh, I have a book now, I'm an author now, whatever, but because this is a, this is a message that's been burning in my heart. This is a message that's been burning in my heart. And I believe it's a word for today. There's, there's, there's some danger going on. There's some, this is a call even to the body of Christ, to the church, to awaken our hearts toward the Lord. And I'm going to share about that uh, with you. The, the book itself is really about two things. Hey, Jeff, what, what's, your, your, what's your main thing? I said, you know what? When, when we boil it all down... I would say my number one thing is I just have a passion to help people get closer to God. I mean, it's real simple. If I just ask everybody in this place, would you like to get closer to God now, for for now, than you have been in the past? Would you like to grow closer to God? I would say most people in this place would say, yeah, it doesn't matter if you've been walking with God for 50 years or five minutes. You're like, I want to get closer to God. And I have this passion. I believe that that's God's passion for you as well. His number one passion is that you would grow closer to him because he recognizes that if you'll do that, then everything else will take care of itself. Yet we get so distracted. So the book itself really has two things. It actually goes back and talks about some of the things in my story about the times, the years I was in Sonic Flood and how God was awakening pure worship in me. It's just a little bit of testimony, some stories in there, some history, all that, kind of take you back a little bit. But then I also talk about how you can also increase your passion for God and grow closer to the Lord, which again, as we said, is something that each one of us desires. So I put some very practical things Uh, Some very, I guess I would say, intense and challenging things as well in there to say, hey, do you want, you know, I I want us to stop wishing that we were closer to God. You know, how many of you guys are ready to stop wishing that you were closer to God and actually start becoming closer to God? That's what we want, right? And so we want to stir, we want to stir up our hearts for God that he would awaken pure worship in us. Uh, What I have felt like is that sometimes we are tempted, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here today, all right? Uh, but just, just hang with me, all right? So I want to challenge you. I want to challenge myself as we would all want to go deeper. Sometimes we're tempted to walk more closely with religious activities than we are with the King of Kings himself. You know, it's a different thing to do the religious activities. That's a different thing than actually hanging out and having a walking and talking, vibrant fellowship or friendship with God. And it's a beautiful thing because God is calling us each each into a deeper friendship with God. Who thought that we could ever be friends with the God of the universe? I mean, we know the Bible says that, but think about that. Think about the beauty of that. It's truly amazing to me. To me, I grew up in a family that loved the Lord. Um, My parents have been in ministry all their lives. My dad is 78. My mom is 77. My dad still works part-time for Youth for Christ. He has for 54 years. So ministry is in our blood. We've been, I, I, I got saved when I was four. My dad led me to the Lord on my knees beside my bed. And I love it because that's something that the beauty about Christianity. It's so deep and so rich, but even a four-year-old can understand that he needs Jesus, right? So that's me growing up. I grew up knowing that, hey, I should read my Bible and I should pray. Gotta, but I got to be honest, I think sometimes I think I thought of those things more as religious activities that kind of were the gateway for me to get to go to heaven. You know, I'm like, okay, if I check off these to-do items, if I read my Bible and I pray, then I get to go to heaven. And I, and I realized later in life, man, that's not what it's about at all. That's not what it's about at all. In fact, even I told you, you know, I, I kind of went to a church where if you raised your hand, we thought you had a question. So the idea of vertical expression to God and worship, I didn't, it never even dawned on me that we could actually connect with God in relationship as we sing a song and it's a beautiful thing but God is calling us into this to understand there's this thing this word that when I was I remember when I was in middle school I heard this word intimacy with God and I don't know I'm just saying maybe I'm wrong here I don't mean to be sexist or anything but I'm thinking 
that maybe guys, us guys, we have a little bit more difficulty with thinking about intimacy when it comes to relationship with God. We're like, well, I don't know if I want to be intimate with God, you know, I mean, that seems kind of weird. Or when we start talking about the bride of Christ, you know, like, yeah, I'm the bride. Wait, I don't really want to be a bride, but obviously it's a metaphor, right? And there's this beautiful metaphor about relationship with God. I remember hearing songs when I was growing up that I wasn't familiar with. It would be like love songs to Jesus, which really we call those worship songs today. But for me, it seemed a little bit odd. Like, whoa, can I really be that close with God? He seems like he's kind of far away. But I had a misunderstanding of what God was calling us to. And I think some of us still have degrees of misunderstanding when it comes to relationship with God. Check this out. All right, so in the book, Awakening Pure Worship, the subtitle is Cultivating a Closer Friendship with God. Now, this is nothing new, but at the beginning of every chapter, I put a quote from someone else. So the opening chapter, opening chapter, chapter one, is a quote from A.W. Tozer. You guys heard of A.W. Tozer? I mean, this guy goes after it. I mean, he's a real deal, right? So you, you get these quotes, and he just says this. It's super simple. But you got to think about it for a second. He says this, we are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. Let me say it again. We are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. Now, typically, I love this quote because typically we think of preoccupation or being preoccupied as a negative thing. Right? You're like, man, I was preoccupied with this, and I should have been doing this. You know, I was preoccupied, and I forgot to do what I was supposed to do. But A.W. Tozer, he, he flips it on us. He's like, what if, come on now, church, listen to this. What if we were so preoccupied with our relationship with God that we forgot to buy into the lies of the enemy? No, I don't think you heard me. I don't think you heard me. All right, let me say that again. What if you were so preoccupied with your relationship with God, you forgot about all the needs that you felt you had and and all the things that you desired for this world. You forgot about all the temptations of this world. You forgot to give in to the things of this world and you begin to buy into all the truths of God. What if you were so preoccupied with God that you didn't even care what anybody said? What if you were so preoccupied with God you began to love your enemies? Those people that talk bad about you instead of talking bad about them, now you're so preoccupied with God's love for you that you begin to do what he's called you to do, which is to love those who might not love you. What if you were so preoccupied with God you forgot to sin? I mean, do you hear what I'm saying? What if, what if we were so preoccupied with God that we forgot to do all that stuff that we're so tempted to do? Because we were so, I heard a guy, I heard a preacher say, he was, it was a marriage conference and he was talking about uh, adultery and all this stuff. He's like, you know what, guys, bottom line, we can go through all the reasons why you shouldn't, how you shouldn't, what you should do to avoid it, whatever, how to keep your relationship, your marriage right. But if you'll just spend time with Jesus, I mean, if you're, he said this, he said, if you're spending two hours a day with God in intimate fellowship, reading your word, praying, worshiping, there's no way you're going to have an affair because it changes your heart. You have no desire. You're so preoccupied by your relationship with God. You ain't got no time for that foolishness. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? So it's a beautiful thing. So we're going to look at the scripture. I'm going to look at a passage in Luke 10. All right, Luke chapter 10. You're familiar with this passage, but I want to bring it in. I want to highlight it. I want to zero in on this one thing. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. That's Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. It says this. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, They came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Verse 39. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. Verse 40. But Martha was distracted 
by the big dinner that she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, and this sounds like us, doesn't it? This sounds like something we might say. Well, nobody in here would ever say something like this, but our kids might say something like this. <laughs> the Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work. Come on, can anybody relate to that? You know, you ever been doing all the work and somebody just sitting there watching TV or whatever, you know? Like, come on, I'm the only person working here. Martha's a little frustrated with her sister because her sister's just sitting around. He, she said, tell her to come and help me. Verse 41, but the Lord said. Now see, those are important words. But the Lord said said time to listen right but the lord said to her my dear martha <laughs> now i don't know if that was a my dear martha or if it was my dear martha or however she said it however however he said it my dear martha you are worried and upset over all these details but there is only one thing worth being concerned about come on somebody whisper one thing one thing there's only one thing worth being concerned about mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her guys we are on a treasure hunt we're looking for the thing that is the one thing right? We're searching. The whole world is searching for that thing. What is it? Jo they'll bring joy and happiness and peace and pleasure and all these things. And Jesus just highlighted it right there. So, so Mary wasn't really just sitting around. What was she doing? She was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, of course, we're not saying, Jesus is not saying here that work is not of any value, right? But he's setting an order of things, a priority of things. He's saying if you have to choose, the only two things to choose are to work or to sit at my feet, you got to choose sitting at my feet because it will change your life. In fact, it will change the way you work too. It'll impact, if you will sit at the feet of Jesus, it will also impact every other area of your life. So that's where it all starts. He's showing us an order of things, right? And many times we get that order flipped around. So let's jump into a couple of thoughts here, all right? Number one, God invites us into unimaginable close friendship. To me, it's, it's, you almost have to stop and just think about it for a second. Because you're telling me that the creator of the universe wants to hang out with me? Like I'm nothing. I'm like a piece of dust, like compared to him, right? But he's saying, and sometimes people just wallow in that. They'll be like, oh man, I'm a piece of dust. He wouldn't want to hang out with you. But it's amazing because he's saying, no, I want to be with you. There's this invitation that he has given every single person. For some reason, we reject it for different reasons. Some of us reject it because we want other things beside what he invites us into. Others of us reject his offer, his invitation to have close fellowship because we don't think we're worthy. We know that we're not worthy, but the blood of Jesus made a way. Come on, it made a way. So he invites us. I say this, so few of us seem to actually walk in this close fellowship with God. It's almost if, church, that we really have bought into the idea that it's just Moses and Abraham and the apostles and the pastors and the leaders that are called into this intimate friendship with God. But that's the whole point of the cross. He, God has called each one of us into close fellowship with him. He's inviting you to come closer to him in relationship. He wants to have a face-to-face, one-on-one, walking and talking relationship with you. I said this in the book, worship is not an obligation, it's an invitation. 
Now, I shared a little bit about that on Friday, but this is so important for us to be able to flip this mindset, right? So many people see like the church, the religious. How do you know if you're having intimate fellowship with religious activities? You feel like you have to instead of you get to. That's the difference. Because I, I said that earlier. I said some of us, I think, we're tempted to have more relationship, in a sense, with religious activities, doing the things, going through the motions of religious activity, rather than actually having fellowship with the Creator. But the way that you know, like, well, I don't know. Is that me? Is that what I'm doing? Well, the question is, do you have an I have to mentality or an I get to mentality? I don't have to go to church. I get to go to church. I don't have to read my Bible. I get to read my Bible. Come on. I don't have to lift up my hands. I get to lift up my hands. I don't have to dance with my feet. I get to. See, we got to change that mentality. Come on. Because somebody's back in the back sometimes going, well, I don't know. They're telling me I should lift up my hands. I'm not going to lift up my hands. It's not about us telling you. You get to do it. We're inviting you. We're not commanding you. Now, God is commanding you. But why does God command you to do things like lift up your hands? Because he wants to laugh at you and go, look at them. They're lifting up their hands. No. He's giving you commands because it's good for you. Right? It's good for you. So if he's called you to lift up hands, if he's called you to dance, if he's called you to sing or shout out, it's because it's good for you. He wired you to do that. And for us to refuse what he's inviting us into only is something that hurts us. It doesn't hurt the person next to us if we refuse to worship. It doesn't actually hurt God. It, it saddens him, but it doesn't take away his glory. The only person that hurts is us because God invited us into this beautiful relationship that is good for us. Come on, let's go, let's go. Bob Sorge says it this way, do you want to be, now listen to this, do you want to be near God in the age to come? And of course the obvious rhetorical answer is well yeah. Then he says demonstrate it by living close now. Like, there's not many people that would, would, would be like uh, in disagreement with me if I said, hey, would you like to be in heaven with God when you die? Most people would be like, well, yeah. Well, then guess what? We need to demonstrate that passion to be close to God then, now. Now. Because you can't tell me that you want to spend eternity with God if you don't spend now with God. You see what I'm saying? So we, 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 we show what we desire by the way that we live this life. We prove that we want to be with God by being with him. <laughs> it's not rocket science. I mean, but it is very, it's a pivotal thing that you have to have a shift in your mentality because he's inviting you into something beautiful. Number one was God invites us into unimaginable close fellowship. Number two, we misunderstand the purpose of of the cross. Now, you guys are going to have to, like, like don't, don't throw anything at me yet, okay? All right, just hang in there. Don't, don't pull out the tomatoes or bricks or anything like that. All right, just hear me. We misunderstand the purpose of the cross. What would you think if I said something like this? God did not, let's say Jesus. Jesus did not die for your sins. Pause. Wait. Don't throw anything yet. Just wait. Okay. Jesus didn't die for your sins. Let me finish the statement. He died to reconcile you to the Father, but your sins were just standing in the way. Okay. You feel that? Because so many people who go to church, and I know it's not at this church, right? But we're just preaching to the choir right now, right? But so many people that go to church they think that forgiveness is the end. Whoo, thank goodness I'm forgiven. I get to go to heaven. You missed the point. Because forgiveness is not the end. It's the beginning. <laughs> it's the beginning. It's the gateway, right? This forgiveness is not the end. Jesus didn't die for your forgiveness. He knew that you need to be forgiven in order to what? To have fellowship with the Father. Sin broke the fellowship. 
So in order to restore the fellowship, we needed forgiveness, right? I'll say it this way. We talk about in that scripture, the one thing, right? I'll say it this way. Salvation, not the one thing. It's the thing that makes the one thing possible. Come on. You follow me, right? Salvation, like, woo, thank you for salvation. Yes, amen. We need to forgive. We got to thank the Lord for salvation. But that's not the end. It's the beginning. It's the thing that opens the door for the one thing. Salvation is not the one thing. It's the thing that makes the one thing possible. Right? Amen? Right? So we misunderstand the purpose of the cross. Let's say it this way. Heaven is not the end goal either. I said this in the book. Granted, heaven is a wonderful place. But it's not wonderful because it's heaven. It's wonderful because it's where God is. It's where the Spirit of God is, where Jesus is, where the Father is. We wouldn't even want to go there if he wasn't there. Like the end goal is not to get to heaven. That's what a lot of people think in our world today. It's like, oh, question is, are you going to heaven or not? You know what? It's not about going to heaven. The reason you want to be in heaven is because God will be there and he's going to be, we're going to be able to see Jesus face to face. We'll be able to hang out with him. I got news for you. Nobody's going to care about the golden streets. Nobody's going to care about the mansions. Nobody's going to care about the crowns. Nobody's even really going to care when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm just going to hear his voice and fall down on my knees because it's him that I'm after. It's not the golden streets. It's not the mansions. It's not the forever. It's not even eternity. It's him that I'm after. And guess what? He's after you. That's all he's after. He's not after your religious activity or your church attendance or your good works, even though those things are good. But that's the fruit of relationship. The root is our fellowship with the creator that's the end goal amen right so we misunderstand the purpose of the cross number two number three everyone on the planet worships something this is a new concept for me a few years back a guy named louis giglio many of you guys have heard of him he's a great speaker he's also a songwriter works with the passion movement has a church all this stuff right he wrote this book called the air i breathe and in this book, he talks about how everyone worships. I'm thinking to myself, what? Like, I thought only like Christian people or like religious people worship. No, he's like, no, because worship is just how you value something. So whatever value you put on something, it's you giving a certain element or certain aspect of worship to that thing. I mean, I gotta be honest, I really love ice cream. Any other ice cream lovers in the house? Come on, somebody, anybody else, all right? Like, I love dessert, but I mean, it's ice cream all the way, and I like particular kind of ice cream. I like Ben & Jerry's ice cream. Anybody ever had Ben & Jerry's? Like, I, we, we, got no, we got Ben & Jerry's haters in the house today. I don't know, but if you haven't had it, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna tell you to go get any, because if you do, you could get addicted. So don't go get any Ben & Jerry's. Do not go to the store later and buy a $6.99 pint of, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> of Ben & Jerry's. But, you know, when I thought about this, in his book, Louis Giglio is like, you know, whatever you worship, you become. And I thought to myself, well, I could spontaneously combust into a pint of Ben & Jerry's if I'm not careful. <laughs> No, because I absolutely love it. But in a sense, what we're saying is, now it's not wrong to enjoy certain things, of course, right? But it's value that you place on something. So many of us worship our work, and we do so not because we're actually saying, I praise my work, you know, but it's because of the value that we put. We take our resources, and we spend them on certain things, and that is worship. And guess what your greatest resource is? It's your time. Time is an even greater resource than money. Money you can get back. Time, once it's gone, it's God. Now, God can re, re, uh, re, you know, store time in a supernatural sense, right? But time, once it's spent, it's gone. So how you spend, how you invest your time, your resources, it shows what you worship. Make sense? It shows what you worship. Uh, says here, uh, John Wimber, one of the quotes in the book says this, show me where you spend your time, your money, and your energy, and I'll show you what you worship. 
So everybody worships. If we don't, listen to this, if we don't worship God, the very choice we make not to worship Him becomes the choice we make to worship something else. Does that make sense? Right? If we're, we're literally worshiping it all the time, meaning that we're putting value on something, then you could say that if we don't worship God, the very choice that we make to not worship Him becomes the choice we make to worship something else. So just be aware of that because every choice we make shows what we value slash what we worship. That's number three. Everyone on the planet worships something. Number four, ministry for God must never supersede intimacy with God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would say for us today, this is one of the most challenging parts of this sermon because many of us, pastors, leaders, writers, Christian people in general, we struggle with this because there are so many verses that have lots of religious things for us to do that are all good, right? Sharing the gospel, feeding the poor, all these things are so good. But the danger lies when we value ministry over intimacy. And I got to be honest, this is probably the biggest sticking point for me in this book. If I can get my pastors and my leaders all over the nation, because we're, I mean, it's not like I'm not tempted to do this as well. We all are, because you know why? We get our value from what we do instead of of who we are, right? But we're not human doings, right? We're human beings. God has called us to become. We get it turned around, ladies and gentlemen. We think that if we'll do something great, like get a million views on Facebook or invent some big thing that everybody buys into or whatever, if we'll do something great, we'll become someone great. But in the kingdom, it works the opposite. Because we seek God so that we might know God. And as we know God, even Louis Giglio said, you become like what you worship or you become what you worship. So as you, you know God, then you become like him. And as you become that being, guess what flows out of when you become like God in a sense, when you become like his, you, you, you inherit his character, then good deeds and acts and ministry flow out from who we are. It can't help but happen. It's going to happen. But we have to get this flipped around because if we're trying to find our identity in our doing, the devil is really happy with that. I mean, how many people do good deeds and they don't know Jesus? Just because you do a good deed doesn't mean that you're going to spend eternity in the kingdom of heaven with God. Right? So it's not about the good deeds. It's about knowing the good Father that will help us turn our good relationship into good deeds. Right? God's plan has never been for us to achieve goodness as a result of doing great things, but to do great things as a result of the greatness He has put within us by His Spirit. Right? I'll just take it one, one level further, just Matthew 7, 22 to 23, it says this, and this challenges us, on judgment day, many will say to me, Jesus is talking here, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name, we performed many miracles in your name. Now, are those three things, things that God has told us to do? Yes, they're very important. And I would not stand up here today and say, don't do these things. But listen to what Jesus says. Many have done those three things, but he says, but I will reply, I never knew you. He didn't say because you didn't do it right, or you didn't use the right strategy when you were praying for healing, or you didn't do it often enough, or whatever. He just said, the reason you're disqualified is because you didn't know me. You did the acts, you did the works, but you didn't ever know me. Again, he's highlighting not that it's bad to do works. He's highlighting an order of things. 
If there's anything you should fight for, it should be a deeper, closer walk with God. And guess what's going to flow out of a beautiful, powerful relationship with God? Miracles, healings, prophecy, all of those things are going to flow out when you have a real encounter with God. Instead of seeking to do miracles, seek the miracle worker and he'll do it through you. You follow? Amen? Amen? Right? All right, number five. I'm just going to get a couple more real quick here and we'll be done. We must avoid being absent in God's presence. Now, I'm going to keep this real short right here, but this is so important. Talked a little bit about this on Friday night. But a lot of times we get confused about God's presence. Does it come? Does it go? Is it an it? (laughs) What is it? And I realize, you know what? So many times the devil wants to get us to think of God's presence as an it instead of a him or a something instead of a someone. See, we're not searching for an emotion. What happens so many times, you come into a service like we had Friday night or even this morning, and you will notice that you feel a certain way. So the natural temptation is to try to reproduce those feelings in the next service instead of just seeking after the King of Kings. And so then you start seeking emotions and you start you start misunderstanding that the presence of God is not an emotion. And guess what happens? Then you can't recognize the presence of God if you don't have an emotion. But the presence of God is always accessible whether you feel it or not. And you can say to him, Lord, I am standing in your presence. I don't have any goosebumps. I don't have any tears. Although many times you will have tears and goosebumps, whatever, when you do encounter the presence of God. But don't mistake those feelings and emotions for God's presence. So many times we think of God's presence as something we have to lure into our services instead of something that we should just come into. There's two verses. I won't read the verses, but I'll give you the references. Ephesians 3.12 and Hebrews 4.16. Ephesians 3.12 and Hebrews 4.16. Both of those verses say this, come boldly into my presence. See, it's not so much. Now, we can go on and on. We can talk about the omnipresence of God versus the manifest presence of God. Does his presence come and go? Can it move? Absolutely. It's a both and. It's also that his presence is always available. But you know what? It hit me one day when I was leading worship. The problem is not so much, God, would you just show up? Honestly, the question is, will we show up? It's not so, I mean, honestly, the the problem is not, God just won't show up. Like, he's late. Where is he? Why won't he be here? A lot of times it's us. And I'm not even talking about physically show up in the building. That's a problem too, right? But I'm talking about show up spiritually. Will you be present in his presence. Don't be absent in his presence. Don't disengage in his presence, but engage. Amen? So we must avoid being absent in God's presence. The last point as the band comes, worship was not made for God. Now, this is a sticking point for some people too. Like, whoa, what are you talking about? Worship not for God. I say it this way in the book. So worship is about God, and it's to God, but it's for us. Now, this is just uh, preposition usage, right? You're like, what do you mean worship is for us? That sounds like heresy. Like, you're talking about worship is for us. All I'm saying is, when we're worshiping God, who's changed the most, him or us? So we're not saying that God doesn't deserve the glory and that the worship doesn't go to him, but it's designed for us. He cannot become greater or lesser if you choose to worship him or not worship him. But guess what? If you choose to worship him, it will change your life. If you choose to engage in his presence, it will transform you. It doesn't transform him because he's not the one that needs transformation. It's me. I need transformation. Guess what? My ears desperately need to hear my mouth declare the praises of God. Come on. Come on.